Okay, this is our free weekly Q&A for the gardening and farming and all that fun stuff. We are going to be talking about our brains tonight and how we think. This is week 88. This is the place where we talk about all things related to being a better human being. The Georgic tradition is all about the best harvest from the soil, according to the ancient Greeks and a whole bunch of other fantastic people around the world. Not that the Greeks were the epitome of fantastic, but they did start Western civilization, and that's pretty cool. So here we go. We're going to get talking about this stuff here. These are the nine ways that I help people to grow food. I have a YouTube channel. We do the weekly Q&A, which is what we're doing tonight. And we have a Patreon channel. I am a laboratory to do soil tests if you need your soil tested. We do a Georgic school room, which is 17 weeks long in the summertime. We have a three-day boot camp, and one of those is coming up pretty quick. I'm available for consulting if you want to learn how to do something specifically on your own land. Call me. We will talk. And you can. I'm for hire for that. My book, Worry for Eating, is out. I actually have another book out, too, which is super fun. And my newsletter comes out whenever we get around to saying something. We send out a newsletter. So if you want to get my newsletter, go to www.georgiarevolution.com okay. and sign up for that. Uh, boot camp. Everybody needs to know this. April 25, 26, 27. That is a three-day class on my place where I live where you come and you go into the greenhouse and I teach you everything I know in three days. And so that's pretty fun. Actually, it's to help you have the best garden of your life. Uh, we bring you in, we show you how to do this. And I've had really good reviews from people who have gone home and, and then they have learned how to grow really great food. And they say, your, your methods are different than other people, but when we implemented them, it made gardening easier it made the food taste better, and it was really nice. Come here. This is Esther Marilla Joy. She's going to help me teach this tonight because she's the smart one in the family. Okay, we're moving on here. Summer class, this, we are still taking applications for the Georgic School Room this year. We still have room. We've had a fantastic people sign up. Many of you are here tonight. And we are still taking applications. So just let people know. And what they need to do is to go to the website and look through it and see if they think that this class would be for them. And then fill out an application and send it to me. If anybody has questions, just text me and we can talk about that. The reason I say to text is if you call, I don't always answer my phone because sometimes my hands are very dirty. So text is good and then, I, and then we can communicate. But the summer class is great. This is how we build good people. This is how we grow good food. This is how we create the very best soils. This is how we restore old, um, worn out farmland so that you can grow in it with none of the man-made things like pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers. We can fix soil so you don't need to buy any of that stuff. So that's what the Georgic School Room is about. And here's our picture I showed you last week. I was about to take it out because I already showed you, but I thought, you know what, I'm gonna show you again. Because we had this really fun herb class on, I think it was the 27th of February, and we made these cool things. A friend of mine who is a master herbalist came over to the ranch, and we made these cool tinctures and oils and salves, and so it was really awesome. So here's that. And we're going to be doing this in our Georgia School Room summer class this year, so I'm excited about that. Our books for next week. So this week is March 7th, As a Man Thinketh. Next week is Green Grass in the Springtime. This is a longer book than this week's book. So you need to start reading quickly if you're reading these books and following along. You'll need to get this one started pretty quick. So Green Grass in the Springtime by Tony Malmberg. And I actually um, invited him, but I don't know if he'll be here for, for that. I'm not sure he can make it. But he's a friend of mine. Uh, he lives in Oregon right now. So it'd be super fun if, if authors can show up to some of these. Um, that was the wrong button. I stopped the screen share. So let's go ahead and get started with our discussion on As a Man Thinketh. 
So I love this book because it helps us get a mindset where we are thinking the right way. And that I think that's a really important thing to do. I think we need to be thinking properly. We need to have our we need to wrap our heads around uh you know what's what's good, bad, true, false, right, wrong. We need to wrap our heads around reality and we need to have personal responsibility. Uh, we find in the psychology world that people who blame others tend to not have as quality of lives as people who choose to take responsibility for their own life. And to sum up this book in a nutshell, that's what it is. It's about taking responsibility and realizing that no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in, in any point in our life, we need to take responsibility and start doing the right things. So who has a thought about the book? Uh, this is a, a just a simple discussion. Don't be shy. You can turn your camera on so we can see your smiling face and you can unmute and you can totally interrupt me and say, I have something fun to say. I have something to say. So I... So, the part that has always stuck in my brain from when I first read it is when it says that our mind is like a garden and what we plant there grows. And so sometimes when I'm thinking a negative thought or being down about something, I think about that and I kind of just think like, oh, I'm growing a weed. So I should not do that. <clears throat> so I think it is a really good analogy and it is really powerful to realize that the things that we think the things that i think um affect my life and i feel like i feel like i can see it in people who um you know, you think about the people that you know, and there's some people that are um, a little more pessimistic, and there's some people are who are a little more happy, and it just shows in their life. So I think it's a cool idea. Thank you, Becca. That was awesome. All right. If somebody wants to share next, go ahead. Be the first one. Or the next one. I can share my thoughts. Friendly, go right ahead. Thank you. Um, I really, really liked the book. At first, I, I listened to it, but then I had to get the physical copy because my mind just couldn't comprehend that fast. <laughs> and so I, I read it and... um. I think my favorite part was just the fact that while I was serving my mission, I spent a lot of months and, and transfers focusing on, on the Christ-like attribute of virtue, and I could never put what I learned into words. And I just like couldn't explain to people the things that I was learning, but like I knew it was like it's all about your thoughts and like how that attributes to your actions. But I'm just so bad at speaking, so I was like, I can just never put this into words but as soon as I read his book I was like that is what I was trying to say the whole time but um so I loved the way that he portrayed the importance of our mind and how it affects everything that we do um how it affects the words that we speak and, and our actions and um and like Becca was saying I really liked the garden analogy too that put it in a clear image for me um, and honestly, I can't even voice all the thoughts I had. I I really, really enjoyed the book and that element of eliminating doubt and fear of our lives so that it can make more room for those good, wholesome, virtuous things that we can have more light and joy in our lives. Um, so yeah, I want to work more on controlling my mind, I guess. Nice, nice. So Becca and Brindley both um, talked about the analogy of the garden and how the garden is a place where we plant things and grow things. And depending on what we plant, depends on what grows. And 
but the mind, you know, it's the most fertile thing that we find on in the universe, I think, is the human mind. And so what we're planting in the mind, how are we cultivating that? Are, are we letting the weeds grow? Because they certainly will sprout in our minds. Or are we letting the, you know, are, are we just letting it go wild like a, just a jungle? Is that what's in our mind? That's why I can't sleep at night because I have a jungle going off in my mind. <laughs> we need to learn to calm down, right? There's probably an herb for that to help your mind calm down. Maybe it's nutrition. Maybe I need to eat better food. But anyway, so that's a, just a great thing. I'm glad that you guys brought that up. Uh, that is really cool. Kate, does anybody want to share? Esther, come here. Marilla has something to share. Okay, so I was kind of thinking about it, and I was thinking, I don't know how many of you have ever listened to Earl Nightingale's The Strangest Secret, but it's kind of that same philosophy of, like, what you think, like, kind of changes what happens in your life. So, like, if you think about something a lot, and, like, if you're thinking about really good things, really good things are kind of what happens. And so it's kind of this thing of, like, cultivating your mind, like you guys were saying, like, cultivating those good thoughts and, like, I don't know. I think it kind of makes me think of like prayer and meditations and things like that, like constantly trying to think about those things and do those things that brings your mind to a place where it's at peace. So like chemically, you have all of your um, dopamine and serotonin and all those things in your brain instead of being filled with all this cortisol and all the, the anxiety and stress emotions being filled with the emotions that make us like do the things that make us strong, make us happy, make us want to go out and do things. So I think that's really cool. Nice. So stay here a minute. Okay. So you, <laughs> you mentioned something really important. Mm -hmm. You said that a lot of times in our minds, if, if we're thinking the right way, really good things happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about when we're doing everything right and where we have a very good thought process and then like eight bad things in a row happen that really knock us down? life man that's how it is sometimes <laughs> that really is life I think a lot of that comes down to this I don't know like the whole mortal experience um just keep trying because obviously things aren't going to be right the first time and so there are a lot of times where we have to keep trying and keep cultivating and it's like you can cultivate the perfect garden and you'll still have a hailstorm that'll come in and destroy it and you still you don't stop gardening forever you still you keep gardening it's the same thing with those thoughts you keep going and sometimes there are ways to get help for that, you know? You can make a greenhouse so that when the hailstorms come down, they don't destroy your garden. You can you can talk to people. You can get help for things like that that happen in your life. You can communicate with the people around you. I think it's super important to not just do it with our own minds, but be connected. Like they, things like this where you're connected in a community of people that make all of our minds grow together. And as we share and as we learn, it builds ourselves up and it builds up our minds and our thoughts so that we're all kind of thinking on a community level perfect it really helps yeah. okay nice okay who else wants to go talk say something about the book we read i can share something nice starla thank you go ahead um so it was all about thoughts <laughs> um and something that i wanted to um bring up was that a lot of our thoughts um follow what we believe and our beliefs and so um you can keep trying to change your thoughts but I feel like there's times when if you don't change the belief behind the thought <laughs> you know whatever is the fear whatever is causing it I guess um it's not going to change everything like he's saying you know it's like there's more behind it than just the thought. That was something that um, he kind of talked about, but kind of not. Um, but yeah, does that does that anything make sense? It wasn't necessarily about the book, but it well, yes, because there's it was all about thoughts. And so, um, bringing in other things that I've also read from other books, it's um. I don't know. There, there's just more to it. I, there was, there's so much more to it that I want to add that I'm like, it's not just this. Um, yeah. 
No, Charlotte, that's awesome. Yeah, um, good points. Good points. So quick question. So I'm going to let more people talk, but quick question here. Why are we talking about this in a gardening, farming, homesteading type Q&A on a Thursday night? Why did we read this book? Why didn't we read a book about garlic or onions or soil health or strawberries? I have a thought. Peter, go ahead. I don't think gardening is just about gardening. I think when we when we engage with and we are active participants in God's creations, we come to learn about ourselves, we come to learn about God, and we develop ourselves more. And gardening is just like a real life metaphor for our mind, for our spirits, for our bodies, what we plant will grow. And that goes for thoughts. Well, it starts with thoughts. It starts internally. Like, I don't remember his name, but the guy that wrote as a man thinketh. Yeah. James, it starts in your mind and progresses from there, but you have to know what to plant, what needs to be planted for what you want. You can't be effective in your garden if you don't know what you're planting. If you want to harvest squash, but you accidentally plant corn, you're going to be disappointed in your, the harvest. So nice, nice, good points. Okay. All right. Who's next? Go ahead and unmute and share your thoughts of the book. Um, well, I actually, I like that. Just. I'm going to keep answering the question you just asked, if that's okay. Um, I think it it made me think of how, I think one of the first things after questioning everything, reality, what what to believe and what's real, the first thing for me that felt so true was nature and plants and I, I think looking to to the way that something grows you plant it, it and you water it and it just it's everywhere um and there's so much to look up to that nature you look to nature and it teaches you so many lessons um but I think the reason why this book is important in all of this is that gardening and farming is all about manifesting something into the world, bringing something into the world. And this book is all about how our thoughts, everything that we think, everything going on up here is going to manifest into the physical realm. And so I think I think it's really important to make sure every thought, every significant feeling and thought that is coming through through you that you recognize that that's going to uh that's going to manifest in one way or another whether or not you um sometimes you have feelings and thoughts and you're like oh that's a bad one so I'm gonna like pretend it's not there <laughs> and then it's like it'll come out anyway so it's really important that you maintain that garden like everyone's talking about that garden that is there that you make sure when you're thinking about other people and the flaws in other people that anything you criticize is actually it it's somewhat is a reflection of you and so um I think I'm kind of going all over the place but I think like gardening is like the purest form of manifestation and this I believe this book is all about that how manifestation starts with our thoughts and what's going on up here but then it will happen physically. 
All right, Mari, that's awesome. Thank you. I had something I wanted to throw in here. <laughs> so I've I've been studying psychology the last few years, and I just got my bachelor of science in psychology. I graduated in two zero two two. <laughs> and one of the things we study is um, neuroscience and how the brain works. And I think it's absolutely amazing how in 1903, when he wrote this book, he got it absolutely right on how the brain works. There's been a lot that's been discovered over the last 50 years. And people have asked the question, well, do men really have free will? Because the muscles, when they do tests, the muscles are moving before the, the brain even has a conscious thought. People are, are already in action before they think, oh, I will do this thing. Because that was the understanding for a long time was, you know, you think it and then your body performs. But the actual sh science shows that your body begins to do something before you have time to think it. But this is how neuroscience works. We choose our path before the path ever arrives. And wise man once said, when the opportunity to act arrives, the opportunity to plan and to choose has already passed. And so as a man thinketh is absolutely the practice of choosing the path you want to take long before the path ever arrives, long before the, the destination is even visible, long before the exit ramp off of the freeway you're, you find yourself on ever comes up. Um, you're deciding who you want to be. You're deciding the kind of decisions that you will make when a particular um, opportunity arrives. Um, and if it's a good thing or a bad thing, you're making that decision beforehand. And this book is spot on. Like long before neuroscience ever proved it, you had it right. This is how the mind works. We decide before the opportunity arrives who we want to be, how we'll live, what actions we'll take when a choice is placed before us. And it's phenomenal and such simple truth and such a wonderful book. So anyway, thought, thought I'd interrupt and throw that in there. <laughs> that, was, that was not an interruption. That, this is exactly why we read these books. Don't we need better farmers? Don't we need more nutritious food? Wouldn't it be cool if we could go to the grocery store and actually get the most nutritious food in the world? Here's what we do. We go to the grocery store in today's world and we get the most abundant food that we've ever known of, but it's not always the most nutritious. Okay, who's next? Who has a comment about the book? I have one. It's kind of piggybacking off of what you guys have already said, but um, I love James Allen. He, um, he's been my mentor for the last what, seven years. I started before a mission and I've read this book a lot of times. But one of my favorite quotes is in chapter two, and I don't know what pages you guys have, but it's called the effect, the, the effect of thought on circumstances. And he said that circumstances, circumstance does not make the man, it reveals him to himself. And when Vernie talks about how awesome it is that like, you know, we choose first and then the path comes when we'd already chosen. Sometimes that gives me anxiety. I'm like, oh my gosh wait, I'm not going to pick all the right paths. Like, oh my gosh. And it like freaks me out. Cause I'm like, I have to pick all the right things now so that in the future I will be ready. And it gives me all of this, like, it, I feel this weight of responsibility that if something happens that I don't like, or I grow bad fruit or whatever, or ve vegetables or whatever he talks about, I have no one else to blame, but myself, right? It's not the circumstances. It's me. And that becomes very self-deprecating for me, or it can, going that down that path. But there's something I learned about freedom and liberty. And I think that James Allen is trying to point out to us that if we want to be able to choose, and if we want to have full responsibility and full freedom um, and liberty in our lives, then we have to be willing to take full responsibility for what happens. And he mentions that there are circumstances that are out of our control. And that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about our reactions and how we choose to operate within our circumstances. He talks about the poor. They're not, they're not, what was the word he used? Um, this last thing I should know. Anyways, they're not like the negative word that he used until they start to blame their circumstances and relinquish that responsibility. 
And freedom and liberty is all about taking responsibility for your own for your own actions and your inner interpretations and your your reactions and your thoughts. And so even though it's scary and it gives me anxiety sometimes, what the beauty of the message is, is that even though we could like dwell in the past all the time, be like, oh, I did all this bad or or dwell in the future and be like, oh, I'm so anxious. I have to decide everything. There's actually a beautiful freedom and peace when we live in the now and we just accept responsibility and we realize that when we accept responsibility, that means there's hope for the future because we can we have control over our own destiny. We can choose and the thoughts that we choose to change now will impact the future. And so we can change the best way we know now now and we don't have to worry about circumstances choosing it for us which is very makes me feel very powerless so even though there are some scary parts of it if we accept the scary and we we're able to move through that um that's when we have the most reward because we have full responsibility and we have the freedom to be ourselves and to control our destiny so i love that that's his message and I think that's a big thing with gardening because sometimes it's easy to just blame the weather or just blame the government, right? Man, if the government would just help us, then we could grow good food, right? But that's not gonna get us anywhere. We have to be able to take responsibility and be able to act within the circumstances and then our circumstances will improve because we can make a change, so. Nice, thank you, Abby. That was beautiful. Vernie and... Esther are applauding you from the other room. <laughs> okay, do we have anybody else who wants to say something about our book tonight before we open it up to Q&A for about gardens? Okay, find your mute button, push it so that you can unmute and say, yeah, I have this brilliant thing to say. You have 10 seconds, and then we're opening it up to q and I just feel like really annoying because I do this every time. We're all- Go ahead, Mari. It's great. Let's hear it. Um, But I guess I think I had already kind of briefly said this, but I think one thing that's a little hard to identify sometimes that's also very important is like, what do I believe? Because everyone believes things. Even when people say, oh, you know, I don't really believe in anything. I can, I can understand like not consciously choosing certain beliefs, but all of us worship something. Um, we all have a God, whether or not we believe in God. And so I think something that's really cool about this book that like a theme of this book is that your actions and your thoughts are aligned. Like they will be, they will be paralleled. Um, and so I guess in order for you to identify what your beliefs are, cause I, I was in a place where it's like, I know I believe stuff, but I want to figure out what all of my habits are and what what's going on in there so that I can kind of like weed things out that I know are kind of messing things up. And so, but, but I wasn't sure exactly what those specifics were, but you can see through your actions, through your daily physical habits, what you actually do believe. And I think, um, it's cool how it goes both ways. Like your actions can show you what you believe and your beliefs will also show you what's gonna happen in your life, what, what will manifest. And, yeah, isn't uh, that the coolest thing? Yeah. I, I love what you're saying. And that is one of the, like that is pretty much the whole book in a nutshell. But the book's so fun because as you go through it, there's like, it's, I've never read a book with so many one-liners, yet it's a super short book. I listen to all my audio books at double speed because then I can get through it twice as fast. And that means in a winter of like six months when I'm doing my education, I can do twice as many books, which is cool. So that's how I do it. I don't know if you guys have heard me say this before. I don't know if I told you, but I want to tell you right now. So my daughter, Esther, that was just here talking a minute ago, she said... Uh, she was listening to an audiobook 
And I said, you can't. And she's listening to it at double speed. And I'm like, you can't hear that at double speed. You can't comprehend that. And so she just calmly turned it off. And she said, okay, test me. I'm like, all right. So I asked her a bunch of questions about it and she knew everything. And so I thought, how does she do that, man? She's a genius. So when I was working in the greenhouse one day, I turned on my audio book and I put it at double speed. And then I got my hands dirty pretty quick because I'm doing stuff. I, they were muddy, you know. And then I couldn't get my phone to turn it back down. And then 10 minutes later of working, I'm listening to it and I'm comprehending it. I totally forgot it was a double speed. So it just takes some time to, to get there. What, Bernie? I'm the only holdout. I like how the words are put together. It's like Bernie slows it down to half speed. <laughs> That's I, I, not true. <laughs> I just love the words. I love the way they're put together. It's just such art history. I love to hear it. So Good. it's like music. You know? Awesome. Okay. Um, what? Any more thoughts on as a man thinketh? I think we're going to open this up to Q&A now. If you came to this tonight to ask questions about gardening, ask questions right now. This is a class where we are not shy. You unmute and you start talking and totally interrupt me. We have a strawberry question. Come on. I recognize you. <laughs> Um, yeah, I am planning to put in about a quarter acre of strawberry plants this year, and don't really know where to start. Um, I've been doing a lot of research um, about like planting, uh, planting, spacing, and all these different things of um, composting, doing my own composting. Yeah, it's just Okay, okay. So so you're starting out, you're gonna do a quarter of an acre of strawberries. You're just starting out, you don't know where to start. You want some advice on how to get started. Okay? Yeah. Is that where we're at? Okay. Have you ever raised strawberries before? Yes, but not on a large scale. Yes, but not on a large scale. Okay, here's what we need to do. You have deer in your neighborhood, right? Lots of them. Because yeah. I basically know where you live, the area. Okay, you need a giant deer fence. The deer will destroy your strawberries. Um, in your climate where you have cool summers, I would suggest you do ever bearers. You're gonna have um you're gonna have the June bearers, they all come on at once, and then right. you have the ever bearers, they're gonna give you a little bit longer. Like 25 years ago when I was doing strawberries, I was like trying to grow them commercially. I wasn't that good at it at that point. Well, I just went with all the June bearers because the ever bearing varieties were not that great back then. But in just in 20 years, there's a lot of really good varieties nowadays that are doing good. Any of the commercial varieties out there that are available to buy as ever bearers, they are pretty good. Okay, so just read about the, the qualities of each variety and then just pick the ones that look like they'll be the best for what you're wanting. Um, let me think. I'm going to go ahead and mute you for a second. I'm getting a little background noise. Um, so, strawberry, what else do you need to know? The main thing, like, yeah, man, you're going to be fighting the deer. Um, I think where you are, you probably have a migration of mule deer going through in the fall. That's when they're really going to be hard on them and wipe them out. And then if you have any deer that hang around your area in the like in the winter time, if you have a few that are hanging around there, they will completely destroy them. They will eat the little crowns all the way into the ground and destroy them. They don't really do that with any other plant that I'm familiar with. So I'm not trying to say not to do it or be a bearer of bad news. I'm really sorry. I'm honestly just trying to warn you that you really need a good fence to keep them out. So if you already have a fenced in area, fantastic if if you don't and you're shaking your head you, that you don't then you're probably going to need to spend some money i'm sorry because you probably wanted to raise the berries to earn some money if you're doing a quarter of an acre 
<laughs> so um, there is a possibility of starting smaller and adding on later. Maybe start a little bit smaller, get going, and then add as you can, if that's a thing. But maybe you can just go ahead and do your whole quarter of an acre and get it fenced and get started. Uh, as, as, as far as growing the berries themselves, there's, there's, oh man, this is like a four hour class. Whatever, how do I put that in a nutshell? You want a really good functioning soil, okay? Probably the way to start that, I hardly ever tell anybody to till anything up, but here's what I'm going to say tonight. Because context matters, okay? So probably just till the place up to help with weed control, unless you already have a, have a fantastic functioning soil, but I've never talked to anybody who does, unless they've been to my classes. And you're shaking your head, no, so good. So we know where we are. Go ahead and just start with your quarter of an acre, till the thing up, and then make some raised beds, form your raised beds. And no, I'm not talking about wooden box raised beds. I'm just talking about like, just like a raised bed, like a, a, a Charles Dowding type raised bed or a, an Elliot Coleman raised bed. Just you take a shovel and you throw the dirt in and then where you threw the dirt away from becomes your walkway about one foot, and then you have like a 30 inch or 36 inch raised bed, okay? And then you can just plant your plants on there. You can even cover them. A lot of people say to cover them like with a tarp or a landscape fabric or whatever. I try not to do that uh, because you want to be feeding that soil with detritosphere that's going, meaning dead organic plant matter that's rotting into the ground. That's what detritosphere is, like compost that you'd put on there. Now, let's just think for a moment. Moment. How are you going to make these strawberries super happy? Well, in Mother Nature, we find strawberries growing in forests. So that tells us that strawberries are naturally a late succession plant. But hold on. What did you just do? You just tilled it up. And if you till something up, it throws it to early succession. So you did totally the wrong thing. Okay. So this gets complicated in people's heads. See how this is a four-hour class? Uh, but don't worry about it. Till it up, make your raised beds, plant your plants, and then you're going to want to put about two inches thick of a shredded, uh, it, like a, a compost that's on there. One reason that they're called strawberries is because in ancient days, they would take straw after they got all the grain out of it to eat and make bread, and they would put the straw in there. Modern people, we think, and I see it in gardening books all the time, and it's true, but it's only a half a truth. They say they're called strawberries because they would put the straw on there, and then when the berry grows, it doesn't get dirt, dirty and muddy because the straw keeps it, the berry nice and clean. That's half a truth. Yeah, it keeps it clean, so that's nice. But here's the other thing. Straw is a fungal food. Who loves fungus? The late succession plants like trees and strawberries because they grow in a forest. So th they did so well with being mulched with straw that uh, people said, oh, they're strawberries because they grow better this way. It's true, they do. But we haven't known until recent decades why. It's because we were getting a high fungal content in that soil. So get started however you can. Whatever research you have done is probably okay. Just get them planted, get it going, but you want to be feeding that soil a lot of organic matter, but you don't want to be feeding it what we would call a green component to a compost. So grass clippings that come off your lawn that are bright and green, if you put those on there, they're very bacterial. They feed bacteria. Well, you want to have more fungus in the soil than bacteria, and that's the definition of late and early succession. Early succession is mostly bacteria, very little fungus. Late succession is lots of fungus, very little bacteria. So how do you balance that in your soil? It's what you're putting on top of the soil to feed the microbes. So if I put uh, dog food outside, a dog shows up and eats it. But if I put cat food outside, a cat shows up and eats it. I know it doesn't work that way, but it's supposed to. <laughs> and it does work that way in the world of microbiology.
If you put uh, uh, fungal food out there, the fungus shows up and starts eating it. If you put bacteria food out there, the bacteria shows up and the fungus doesn't. Uh, what do you need anything else from me tonight? You can always come back next week and ask more questions. So, I do have one more question. I'm going to here. Oh, um, hold on. I I can't hear you very good. Can you can you maybe? No. I can hear that you're talking. <laughs> Is this any better? A little bit better, yeah. Okay. Um. So at the base of we need to heavily amend our soil, very poor soil. Um. And so I've been looking in Okay, okay, hold on. I'm only catching half of what you're saying. I'm sorry. There's there's the microphone's kind of weird. Um, um I'll, I'll in on another device. Uh, you you if you can make it short, type it into the chat real quick. Okay. Go to the bottom of your screen and open up the chat and type it in there. While you're typing, is there anybody else who came tonight that needs to ask a gardening question? If you came tonight to ask a gardening question, just unmute and start asking, or you can type it in the chat. Okay, for those of you who are have your cameras on, who's excited for class this summer? Give me a big smile. Yay! That's going to be pretty great. I'm getting excited too. I'm out of town. I'm in uh I'm in Monticello, Utah. And Becca is at our pl my place. She's taking care of the greenhouse right now. So that's pretty funny. Usually she's in Monticello. A... <laughs> we switched. <laughs> I have a question. Um let me see if, how can I flip my camera? Oh dear. I need to flip it. How do I do it? Oh, I found it. I don't know if you can see this. So there are all these tomato starts and peppers here. And there's one tray that looks a little bit sad. There's not very good light over here. But do you see there's like some leaves falling off? You, you, know, the other trays you know what the tragedy is? Those are my tomato plants we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay if it's somebody else's. <laughs> now I have to diagnose my own through a cell phone camera over Zoom. So but I just I to my these... I've only been gone twelve hours. <laughs> okay, well, I, I, they were looking all like that was me morning. trying to be funny. Um, yeah, I saw I saw that those started doing that about two days ago. Um, what's wrong with them? Uh, they probably got too dry. Um, I think they did. I think they got too dry before I watered them. And then the leaves started to dry up. And so that's what's happening. I needed to water them more regularly. So that was okay. that was just a problem with me. Um, so I'm pretty sure that's what happened. Okay. Well... Hopefully I can avoid that on the rest. <laughs> okay, cool. You'll take better care of them than me. It's a good thing I went out of town, right? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Um, all right, uh, Becky, um, did you log into a different device that maybe I can hear you ask a question? Yes. Is hey, this I can any better? Clear now. This is super better, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I've been learning about composting. Um, so I have to heavily amend our soil. It's pretty poor soil. Um, and I was learning about um, different herbicides that were not getting, I, I guess, killed off in that commercial um, processing of compost. And so I was wondering if because um, obviously I don't want to do all this work to my soil and then harm it. 
um, with commercial compost. And so I was wondering if there's anything to do, um, like if I could buy regular compost at the store and then treat it or something along those lines, because I'm, I'm just not sure what to yeah. do. I don't have a whole lot of green or other material to work with right now, just yet starting out. Yeah. So yeah. that was the question I had. Yeah, so it's it's totally true that a lot of times the commercial composts have um, a lot of problems. So if you go to the, uh, just like anywhere that you can buy bags of compost, like a garden center type store, and you buy compost and then you bring it home and you open it up, if it smells bad, like it's kind of, it, it's yucky, it smells sour or like a, like a, su a, a sewer um, smell, or it just doesn't smell good, it's stinky in any way, it's bad compost. Okay, and you shouldn't be using that on your plants. And I've said that in seminars before, and everybody's like, it always smells bad. I'm like, yeah, it's a serious epidemic. <laughs> and they're like, wait, we just thought it was supposed to smell that way. I'm like, no, if compost stinks, it's wrong. It's bad. And that always scares people because it's what's available. It's kind of like the nutrition in our food at the grocery store. It's not what it should be. It's not that great. So, uh if you open that bag of compost and it's black, like really dark black, like I have, uh, I have a cell phone right here, and then I have a wallet, and I don't know how the Zoom doesn't have the best camera stuff in the world, but maybe you can see a different color here. Uh, but compost should be the very same color as a 70% Hershey's chocolate bar. So it's really dark brown, but not black. And so you can just do a color comparison. If you have a black T-shirt or a black cell phone or something, compare those uh, sizes or the, the colors to the, and you can, and it tells you whether it's good or not. And most of the time, all those potting soils and composts and stuff that you buy from the garden centers, they are black. And about half, like 99% of the time they're black. And about uh, probably in my experience maybe 60 50 to 60 percent of the time they smell bad um, sometimes you will have it looks like mold growing in them and and then even mushrooms coming out of them that's not bad that's actually a good thing uh, if if you have those my, that mycelium which means mushroom material growing um, that's not a bad thing uh, but if it's black and it smells bad and you have the mycelium growing out of them, then it's probably a disease causing mycelium that's going to be spreading disease to your garden. So that's why it's bad. Um, but your question was, is there something I can do to, uh, to compost that I buy so that it doesn't have problems? No, there's not. I mean, I mean, I'm not aware of it and I'm really sorry because I wish there was an easy fix. I don't know. Um, so that's the easy answer. The complicated answer is yes, there is something you can do. You use that compost material as a brown component to a compost and you recompost it. And, and, and so you just make another compost and, and then you, you make it again and it's a, it's a big process and you have to do it right or you just end up with more problems. Which is what we talk about in all, all, the, all the other classes we do, you know, when people come to the farm. Um, but and and here again, I, I want to be thorough with your answer. You you were certainly talking about like um, herbicides, pesticides that could be in the compost that you're buying. Yes, that's absolutely a real thing. A lot of those materials are contaminated with bad things. So, um, I mean, you could, there's a there's a spray they use in Europe. I don't know if they use that in the United States. It might be banned in the United States, which is interesting because the United States doesn't ban very much of this stuff. Uh, but there is one. I think it's called Paraquat, but I don't remember. But they use it extensively to kill weeds in horse pastures in Europe. And then, but and the horse can eat all that stuff. It doesn't seem to negatively affect horses. It just kind of goes through them. It's kind of inert, I guess, to the digestive systems. I don't know. Maybe in three generations, horses will stop having babies. I, I don't know what the long-term effect will be, but it doesn't um, hurt the horses in an acute way. 
but you take the manure from said horses and put it in your compost and you compost it and you do a really good job with compost and then you use that compost in your garden and your plants die and stop growing and so that's a real problem that the Europeans are having to deal with right now because most people in Europe who are buying hay to feed their horses they're having to deal with this issue um so yeah, I mean that's certainly a true thing. It's not just a conspiracy theory of people saying, "Oh my goodness, the world's go we're all going to die because of chemicals." And, and, well, certainly there's conspiracy theories saying that, but but yeah, we're finding a lot of chemicals that shouldn't be in compost. We're finding that in the compost. So is there a way to fix that? I don't know. Um for the normal person, I don't know. Now, for a crazy person like me, yeah, we can use that material that's contaminated. And here's how you do it. You get all that contaminated material. I don't know why you would do this, but here's how you do it. Uh, you gather that all up, you put it in a certain place on your farm or ranch, and then we do a thing that we call bioremediation. We find the microorganisms that will uh, decompose those chemical components and break them apart or they will hold on to them and not release them into the environment so those are your two options you either decompose the bad thing or you hold on to it so i mean i'm sure we've all heard of chernobyl it was the the uh nuclear plant that melted down in the soviet union decades ago and they said oh it'll be a million years before people can live there well, the wildlife is thriving in that city now. People still don't live there, but a lot, all the other animals are doing well. And the scientists have gone in and said, how come these animals are not dying? And they found because there's a certain fungus, probably a whole family of fungus, probably hundreds of species, I don't know. But they go in there and they've grabbed all of the radioactive material and they just absorb it. And this is all microscopic that's happening but they absorb that material and they're not releasing it into the environment. So yes, it can be done, but for me and you who want a quarter of an acre of strawberries, cause that's cool. No, there's not an easy way to do it. Okay, so, so what are we left with? What do we do? Well, you need to get compost from a reputable supplier who's making, who can bring you a dump truck load for your quarter of an acre, um, or you need to make it yourself. And that's kind of where we are right now. Or you just go to Home Depot and you buy a whole bunch. The problem with Home Depot, buying it in bags like that is going to be really expensive. And you don't really know the – just because you're getting it in bags. You need to be able to find a place where you can get it in bulk, you know. The the other thing, maybe – I mean, you're in cattle country. Um, you know, is there somebody in your local area that where you could get a drunk dump truck of just a feedlot manure and the manure has been sitting in a pile for a couple of years? It's not going to be the greatest compost in the world, but if you if you have really sandy, rocky, or clay soil, just putting a dump truck or two of just old feedlot manure and that's been sitting for two or three years, so it's it's aged manure. That would be a fantastic thing to do when you go in there and you um, till up this um, piece of ground. My former students, Becca and uh, Abby, are here. They are like, their eyes are twitching, saying, you're actually telling her to till this up? Who are you and what did you do with William? But but within context of what you're trying to do, um, like I don't know. Do you want your strawberries to produce in five years from now or this year? If it's this year, till it up, get started, and get going. If it's five years from now, there's other ways to do it. But I think you want to get going now, the fastest way. And you're not already starting with a great soil. So tilling, it's not going to hurt it. Can I ask a question? Becca. About uh, compost options. So I'm thinking about worms. Can, um, can you speak to the idea of um, having a worm bin or creating a worm bin? Like, uh, like idea on the ground on the strawberry beds to help with the composting idea? Yeah, absolutely. That's the five-year plan. So that was my answer, but I don't think Beck is satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> 
And it was, it won't really take five years. It's just that you're not going to have a great strawberry patch this year. All right. So here's what you do. Um, if, if you, oh. Another, um, like immediate solution could be some fertilizer, right? Yeah. While you're working on a longer term plan, yeah. you could use some fertilizer. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, either, yeah. So you're, you're going to need to add fertilizer this year. You got to feed those. Um, you need to be feeding your microbes. And that's what the detritus fear is and the worms. That's feeding microbes. While those strawberry plants are growing, you're going to need to be feeding them fertilizer. So you need to buy some fertilizer and feed them for the first three to five years. And then you will get your soil to where it needs to be. Um, like I said, this is a two-hour class, you know. I'm just trying to get you started. And I'm hoping that once you... Think about what I've said tonight. Come back next week with eight more questions. I mean, seriously, just do it. St stick with If you're serious about a quarter of an acre, stick with me for a few weeks until you start wrapping your mind around this. Cover that ground with like six, eight inches of, of old rotten, um, like barnyard manure, wood chips, all this stuff, all this detritus stuff, whatever you can get. And then till it up, make your raised beds, plant your plants, Fertilize them every time you water with a little bit of fertilizer. You just follow the direction on whatever fertilizer you get. A fish hydrolysate is going to be the best thing. Okay, fish hydrolysate. Write that down. Not fish emulsion. Fish emulsion feeds uh, bacteria. Fish hydrolysate is going to feed your fungus, and that's what the strawberries want. So fish hydrolysate, you probably ought to feed them a little bit of sugar too. Um, if you can find some molasses that does not have sulfur in it, that'd be great. Um, I mean, you could even go the miracle grow, grow route. I never tell people to do that, but it will grow strawberries this year. But you don't want to do that for five or six years, or you get too much salt in the soil, and that causes a problem. So get the strawberries going, and then next year, we you you add more compost all around those plants and you mulch them good and keep the deer out oh, hey we had a good strawberry class tonight that's fun okay any more questions any questions about anything you we can even talk about politics if you want <laughs> i had a, a random question kind of um it has to do with soil um out here where i live is the ground is mostly um sand and clay there isn't it's like not very much of anything else <laughs> and so i'm wondering the difference between growing in that and like other other <laughs> dirt and and things okay hey, everything sense. yeah it does are you talking about riverbed ranch i sure am <laughs> okay good so um Everything that I just talked about with the strawberries applies to Riverbed Ranch. Same thing. Okay. Different soils, different state, differences, but everything is the same. What I just said. All right. Okay, perfect. Any more questions? We got time for uh, one more question tonight, I think. All right, I think, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you and I see that fertilizer. That is called fish emulsion. So that's right. a good one, but it's gonna grow more of the fungus, I mean, more of the bacteria than the fungus. Okay. So you, you can get fish hydrolysate from the internet or uh, um, Intermountain Farmer carries it too. But places like okay. Home, Home Depot and Walmart's uh, garden centers don't carry it. Right. They carry okay. the one in your hand. So I, I remembered that this probably wasn't what we wanted. But I would like to know if there's a good way to use it because I found it on clearance and I got a whole lot of it, like 20 bottles. Really, <laughs> really, really cheap. Nice. So is there a good way to use it? Or, you know, I can just throw it away too. It, it, no, no, no. Don't throw it away. It. No, you spent good money on it and that is a good product. 
So here's what you're going to do. You're going to use that on your strawberries to grow your strawberries, and you're going to make sure you have plenty of straw and, and, and little tiny wood chips all over these strawberries okay. so that they're getting fungal food also. I mean, since you already have it, fantastic. Go ahead and use it. It will okay. be fine. And if you have 20 bottles, it'll probably last that quarter of an acre for three years or more. And it okay. can also be used on the other parts of the garden too, like the Absolutely. flowers. Absolutely, you can use that everywhere. Thanks, Becca, that's a good point. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, thank you for being here. Um, next week, same time, different book. Next week, the book discussion is help where's my smart people green grass green grass in the spring by tony malmberg it is uh it's fantastic so the the greatest ecologist he's going to go down in history as the greatest ecologist of our age he's still alive so that hasn't happened because we don't revere the great people until they've been dead for 100 years but he wrote this fantastic um book and then he started teaching all this stuff. Tony went to his um, ranch, which is actually in Africa. It's in Zimbabwe. And he learned how to do all this stuff that this psychologist or um, ecologist did. And then he came home and he practiced it here in the Western um, states in Wyoming and, and now in Oregon. And he has fantastic results with what he's doing because he's following what the ecologist said. And so Tony is the author of the book that we're reading um, this week. So you get the science, but it's just a rancher's story of how the science actually works in the United States. So it is pretty neat. Okay, um, thank you for being here. Remember that this Q&A was brought to you by Survival Garden Seeds. They are online. If you want fantastic heirloom seeds, then you can go to survivalgardenseeds.com and check out what they have. Uh, many of the plants that are coming up right now, seeds that we've planted, have come from them. We're trying them out as we make our own new landrace plants. And if you don't know what a landrace is, um, come back next time. Come to boot camp in a couple of weeks, man. Okay, uh, that doesn't mean it's two weeks away. It means it's coming up. It's the, the dates I showed you a few minutes ago, the last weekend of April. Okay, thank you very much for being here. We're going to close this down. Good night. <laughs>